Hey, I think we're ready to get started. I think one thing that we will have to do going forward now that we're back in person is to build in time for things to get going and things to get uh, to wind down because there's so much great conversation that's happening in between all of the the panels and and all of the different parts of the event. So we'll note for the future. Um, but thank you for your patience and especially your patience uh, to those who are online. This is the beginning of day two of Catalyzing Change, Intersectional Feminist Practice in International Justice, Sexual and Gender-Based Crimes in Angwen. And we have a really special change in the program this morning. We're going to have reflections, but we're going to do it with the entire group of folks who spoke yesterday and who will be speaking today, who are doing this really important work on the ground to seek justice and accountability uh, in Uganda post Angwen, but the, the fight is continuing. And Lorraine has graciously uh, volunteered to keep the conversation uh, going and lively. So I'm going to turn it over to Lorraine, Angela, Victoria, oh, Margaret, and Pamela to give us a sense of their impressions, reflections of what we discussed yesterday and thinking about the conversations that we plan to have today before we uh, get into our opening remarks. Thank you very much, Jocelyn. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to see those who were here yesterday to have you rejoin us and to those who are online um, who were with us yesterday. It's a pleasure to have you back. To those who are joining us for the first time today, welcome. We're really looking forward to continuing what was a very interesting conversation yesterday about the sexual and gender-based crimes in the case of Dominique Ongwen. I have been volunteered by Jocelyn to um, chair an informal discussion, sort of recap about the impressions of our Ugandan colleagues um, on the events of yesterday. By way of reminder, my name is Lorraine Smith Van Lin, and I am the founder of Talawa Justice for Women, and it's an organization that seeks to connect, support, and affirm and empower women survivors and grassroots, I use grassroots, but survivors and community-based organizations that are based in the global majority, otherwise known as the global north, global south, sorry. So, um, Without further ado, I'm actually just going to throw out a few questions to our panelists here, who I will ask only because we may have persons online and we have very special guests in our midst who were not here yesterday, just to briefly introduce themselves. So I'm going to start at the end of the table, Pamela. Good morning. So good morning. I want to thank uh, the organizers for today's event. And yeah, and thank you so much for bringing us to this session. I want to observe all the protocol and also uh, my name is Pame Language. I work for Gulu Women Economic Development and Globalization is a women's rights organization which is established in Northern Uganda to support women war victims and the effects of conflict in Northern Uganda. So I'm happy to be here today to have sessions with you. Thank you. Good morning, um, Margaret Ajok. I'm currently a, an LLM student at Columbia Law School. Um, but prior to my coming here, I was uh, working with the Ministry of Justice, supporting um, the transitional justice efforts there, basically the policy and legal framework for transitional justice. Good morning, everyone. My name is Victoria Nyanjira. I'm the founder of Women in Action for Women. I currently head a skills training school in Uganda. I'm also the founding member of the Leadership Council for the Global Survivor Network. Glad to be here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Atim Angela Lako. I am the co-founder of Batek again, um, an activist for the survivors of sexual violence. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Angela, 
Pamela, Victoria, and Margaret. So just to set the stage a little bit about yesterday, we started with a very interesting opening session that was led by and chaired by the Venerable um, Patty Sellers. And it set the stage contextually for the discussion around what was happening in Uganda and what is still happening in relation to the issues um, concerning victims of sexual and gender-based violence, but the broader issues that are happening in the transitional justice process in Uganda. We moved from there into a what I considered a really deep and intensive discussion around the um, amici submissions that were made in the appeals chamber um, hearing or decision in the Ongwen conviction um, appeal. So it was a very detailed and very intense session where we heard from those who had participated in the amici submissions. So I don't want to recap everything, but I think the last session that also went into some of the structural barriers to participation that dealt with a number of structural and other issues, um, I think rounded the day off yesterday. But what was interesting were, were some of the perspectives shared by um, those on our panel during our conversation session. And I can't, I want to invite them to, for those who weren't here yesterday, to recap some of that. So I'm going to ask, starting with Victoria, what were your impressions of yesterday? Thank you so much once again for giving me the opportunity to speak. And I will be unfair if I don't thank you and women, the Cardozo Law Institute, Talawa, and all the members present for making this happen. Sitting on the table yesterday, just like I am right now, was one great thing. Because as a survivor of sexual violence, an activist, and I put myself as a peace builder, of course, have moved the journey. Having the opportunity to sit here, tell my experience and the experience of the other women who suffered sexual violence back home in Uganda was the most important aspect of yesterday. Then, of course, also affirming, meeting the feminist lawyers who submitted their Michi was a great one. Why? Yesterday I did say it here that we asked ourselves, how can they sit from somewhere and submit issues that affected us without even us knowing the details? But listening to them, you could tell that we are in this together. They researched, they put in issues that we survivors could have not. And at the end of the day, as we discussed, we said it is going to be important to have survivors who are experts of their stories, but issues that continue to affect them work with the different experts to make sure that we address some of these uh, issues once and for all and then ensure a peaceful community. And uh, the other thing that came out so well is uh, the need to involve survivors from the initiation of each and every program through the implementation, if we are to realize uh, other issues. Uh, we talked about ownership. And what does ownership mean in this? If you work with the real people who are affected, first of all, they get to own the process, but also you ensure sustainability of peace in the communities where they live. NGOs will come, NGOs will go, but these people don't move anywhere. They remain there. So we call upon each and every one to work with these communities that we intend to serve. There was a word we use that we are all here for common good. The common good is only if each and every one of us understand themselves, the person next to me, the person beyond me, but then work towards ensuring that we tackle each and everything together in the presence of the U.S. ambassador, I think I will say this as a survivor, governments really support governments. And uh, the best that needs to be done is for governments to task the governments they work with to deliver 
strategies or to deliver what we all envision to see around the world in a rightful way. Uh, thank you. Amazing, thank you very much, Victoria. Um, Angela, I'm gonna give you the chance to share your takeaways from yesterday as well. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I, I am really so happy that I am here. Uh, yesterday too was really so great. I was shocked actually because of uh, the different session that we had and mentioning certain things that some of the things that the survivors at the grassroots at, at, uh, from home were, were thinking that the, some of their voice have not been heard. But when I had uh, the, 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 the feminist uh, scholars speaking out, and mentioning some of the things like Ting Ting, that was great. It touched my heart because I felt that at least we are moving. We are not, we are not beginning afresh. We are somewhere. We have, we have, we have, we have stepped, we are a step forward. So it's just a little bit of polishing and giving and 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 working on the, the, the gaps that we have, like continue, continuous working with the, the, the victims, putting the survivors at the center. It matters a lot if we are working and we are dealing with the survivors, with the issues that are affecting humanity. I am really so grateful for uh, the, ICT, uh, the ICC. At first we were scared because you know with our country and with a lot of corruption and you know when you have money money speaks and then you're you're moving you're living with the the perpetrators you're you're still suffering but you're seeing no results but not knowing that at least there are people who are trying their best to 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 bring change in the community i am touched and I am so grateful for the organizer who invited me. I've never met you. I've, at least I've had some of them on the email. I've, I've seen their names on the email, but I've never met you. We are not beginning afresh. The only thing that I request is that the, the, the issue of funding, the issue of funding survivors have always been left behind because they think that we don't know what we want. People plan for us, people impose things. I would, uh, for example, uh, I would like to talk about uh, the amnesty that they wanted to give to the victims. Why do you give me amnesty? I'm the one to ask for it. This we are saying that why is it the, the uh, I mean uh, about the ICC, the trial of when? We first question that why is it in the heck, and then uh, the one from when is back there in the in the community in Uganda, and we don't know much about the one from when, and we are I mean for for core yellow, how can we coordinate this and talk to uh, the government and see that we work together so that the victims get their reparation, the victims get their freedom. So I am so grateful and thank you. And thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Angela. I'd like to move to Margaret who also was, um, well, you chaired one of the panels but you were also in the audience and there were other broader issues that came out yesterday um, concerning, for example, the intersect between what is happening with Ongwen, but also the transitional justice process in Uganda. Please feel free to share any of your thoughts and impressions. Um, thank you. I think my panel yesterday was, um, it kind of highlighted the challenges policymakers um, have and advocates for justice have especially with regard to the ever evolving um, needs of victims and certain dynamics that we do not foresee. Um, so basically going back to what Angela talked about, she was able to put, to contextualize the case 
the national proceeding against one of the LRA commanders and then the international proceeding. And then she questioned the issue of reparations. She was like, there are reparations in the Ongwen case, but this other case nationally hasn't been concluded and they are the same victims. So like that's, it, it's a key issue, a key challenge for policymakers. So how do you harmonize all that? And it, it kind of really brought home the, the challenges that are there and basically as policymakers and basically as, as justice advocates, things that we should really be aware of. Uh, the other issue that I think that came out that brought up a, a great global, global perspective was also still going back to the issue of ownership. I know um, Angela and Victoria have acknowledged the fact that the team worked hard to ensure that they contextualized the case to Uganda. But one of the takeaways for me was inclusion of national capacities as much as possible in international proceedings. So how much, how much voices do we have at the international level that can really reflect what happens in the, in the, in the national cases? So that was also a key takeaway for me. Um, the other issue that, um, that also was a key takeaway for me was the unique dynamics that victims present. She talked about how each victim is unique and whatever has been captured isn't the whole story. Mm -hmm. And um, it actually uh, intrigued in me um, a challenge that I also have with children born of war. It's something that we haven't talked about, but um, children who have been born of Angela and Victoria, um, there are challenges that they have. And while we talk to Angela or Victoria, we haven't really talked to these children to know what, the, what justice actually means for them. So this kind of tells us the long story of justice. It's something that we have started, but we haven't finished. So it kind of makes me question, will really justice be done? And can it really only be done with a formal justice mechanism? Or can we already start thinking about transformative justice? Can we look at other forms of justice that can be complemented? Can other alternative forms of justice uh, be able to support the efforts that the ICC has, for example, sitting in my place as a policymaker, I know I have been, had interactions with the ICC before and they say, we'll prosecute, you do other things. But of course, um, also as we apply the alternative justice processes, how um, appropriate are they to address the harms, especially when you talk about sexual and gender-based violence, how appropriate are those um, alternative justice processes? So. For me, I think those were the key issues, the ever-evolving challenges that the victims have, the ever-evolving international justice challenges that we need to be aware of and be able to tailor our interventions in that way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret. And last but by no means least, Pamela. Um, Pamela, you were not on any of the panels yesterday, but you were in the audience and you made some key interventions. As a gender activist in Uganda, what are your impressions of the sessions yesterday and what do you see as the key priorities going forward? Thank you, Lorraine. First of all, yes, I want to thank again the organizers and also UN Women for supporting us to be here. This panel looks like a Ugandan panel. <laughs> and I want to thank Lorraine so much for ensuring that victim participation is seen in today's session and yesterday's session. So let's thank her for bringing us here. Yeah. And also thanking UN Women for supporting me because they have to bring Betty with me to allow me participate and really inclusive of disability right. Thank you so much. So the ambassador um, and all protocol of ZAP Yes, in the yesterday conversation, what is standing out for me, uh, one of them was the conversation related to gender sensitivity. And when the feminist group was having a conversation, I was taken up by these two questions. Uh, whose feminist uh, you know, uh, experience are we demonstrating and which one? So it linked me to the life experiences of women war victims. But I also want to emphasize that I was happy with that session because there is this conversation about all crimes are gendered. 
And if we do not have the gender sensitivity of having gender analysis of the crimes, uh, then we will miss out on including it into our implementation. And with this regards, I think it is for the first time that the ICC in the prosecution of Dominic Ongwen took up the highest level of gendered crimes. And the sexual, the, 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 the counts for prosecution were gendered crimes. Now, that links the fact that the life experience of women war victims cannot be underestimated to understand how much is done in their life. I made a BBC conversation last week and I said the war was fought on the body of the woman and the woman bodies become the battlefield. And that means that there's so much aspect of intersectionality that needs to be addressed while having this conversation. The women cannot say it all, including the Angela and Victoria, there are certain gender issue and gender conversation that sometimes women do not bring them public. But as an experienced actor where I work with this women war victim, there are multiple issues. They were abducted, they were taken up through labor, they were fighters themselves, and they were mothers and they were caregivers concerning all other aspects that happened in their life. So to see the feminist lawyers coming here and interrogate that session, Lorraine, was so much touching my life and quite experience for me. And I was happy that that is being taken up. Though I want to note that that has to go to the end of the issues of reparation. The other conversation is on the role of women uh, led institutions at the grassroots and how partnership should be framework, a partnership framework that makes sure that the women are on top of implementation and that they are not seen as uh, non-actors in terms of access to resources. Angela mentioned that, but I think that there is need for systematic capacity building of women organization. When uh, women are validated in the process of call for proposal and all that, they seem not to meet the criteria. And that means that they should not be missing out support because they just miss the criteria. There should be a processes of building their capacity to make them part of the process. Uh, the issues of ownership, you know, uh, Margaret mentioned this, and for me, uh, that means that if we know that we live these experiences, then we should own the processes. Victim voice, so critical in the all overall processes. And I want to thank these organizers because the victim are in the center. Victim centrality can be seen and witnessed in succession, but how many times does that happen, you know? Imagine that certain sessions miss out of that. So we also had the discussions and I love the issues around bringing women to the table and bringing more chairs and asking them to sit to the table. I can say many things, but thank you so much. I think these are the part of that. Thank you so much ladies for this amazing start to today's session. And I think um, I'll hand back over to Jocelyn, thank you. Okay, so we will move right along in our program. And now I'm going to have the distinct pleasure uh, to introduce Ambassador Beth Van Skak, the Ambassador at Large for Global Criminal Justice. Dr. Beth Van Skak was sworn in as the department's sixth Ambassador at Large for Global Criminal Justice on March 17th, 2022. In this role, she advises the Secretary of State and other department leadership on issues related to the prevention of and response to atrocity crimes, including war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Prior to returning to public service in 2022, Ambassador Van Skak was the Leah Lee Kaplan? Leah Kaplan. Leah Kaplan, visiting professor in human rights at Stanford Law School, where she taught international criminal law, human rights, human trafficking, and a policy, policy lab on legal and policy tools for preventing atrocities. I can't believe you did all that teaching at one time. <laughs> it must be kind of a vacation in your new role. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> In addition, she directed Stanford's International Human Rights and Conflict Resolution Clinic. So I'd love to uh, please welcome Ambassador Van Skak to the podium. 
And I, I think what we'll do is we'll ask uh, Ambassador Van Skak to make her remarks, and then we'll open it up to Q&A for more of a conversational uh, response uh, to her remarks. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for including me within this conversation and this gathering. I'm very sorry I wasn't able to attend yesterday, but I really appreciated the recap that we got this morning. It helps to ground, I think, my own remarks in the conversation that's been ongoing. Um, I look forward to participating with you all this morning. Um, thank you to Cardozo for pulling this together. Um, the Cardozo International Comparative Law Journal, the Emergent Justice Collective, the Talewa Justice for Women, and the Global Justice Center. Um, it's so important to have these sorts of conversations and academic institutions have an incredible ability to utilize their convening power to bring together conversations that would not otherwise happen or that would happen with more difficulty. And so that's why events like this are so special. I'm, I'm pleased that we can be together here in person, but also that now we're capable of using modern technology to bring more people into the conversation who might not have had the ability to travel. Um, you know, as Jocelyn mentions, my office does advise the Secretary of State and other senior leadership within the U.S. government on um, both atrocities prevention and response. And so we tend to focus on the whole range of responsive tools that fall within the transitional justice toolkit. In this regard, we're often in a position to advise embassies and posts around the world if they're situated within a country that is undergoing or imagining some sort of transitional justice program. And so it's incredible value, incredibly valuable for me and, and my colleagues like Rachel who are here to hear from individuals on the ground to get the ground truth as to the degree to which some of the promises that might be made during a transitional justice process are actually being implemented or whether there are blockages or other impediments that perhaps some involvement by the foreign diplomatic community, including our own embassy and post, um, might be able to help overcome, or whether there might be some discrete funding that could be provided to help assist with moving a process forward. So I hope that this is the beginning of a conversation and not a, a sort of a one and done. So please do stay in touch. And, and I know that both Rachel and I are, are very willing to be a conduit to our embassy uh, in Uganda and, and elsewhere, and also within the AU, et cetera, um, that are relevant to these important issues that we're dealing with. Um, I, I think this conference reflects the fact that we're at a really pivotal moment when it comes to not only international criminal law generally, but gender justice more broadly, and also the fact that um, gender-based violence, sexual violence, and reproductive violence are finally now, at least to me, feeling much more mainstream than they were when I began my career back in the 1990s, where I had the distinct pleasure of working with the indomitable Patty Sellers, who is here, who is, you know, the mother of the field. Seeing her operate, seeing her operate, we were both at the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, where very easily all of those indictments could have contained nothing but sort of attacks on civilians, attacks on civilian infrastructure, sort of classic law of war um, charges. And Patty made sure to bring a gendered lens to that work. And in every case that she consulted on, she forced investigators and prosecutors to ask questions, to look for sexual violence, gender-based violence, and then to make the commitment to gather the evidence necessary to substantiate those charges to a criminal standard. And it didn't happen in every case. And sometimes those charges fell away but many of them didn't. And that established the jurisprudence that now the ICC is able to draw from. Now national courts are able to draw from as they do their own cases in their own system. And I think people like Patty have really inspired investigators and prosecutors around the world to, to look for, to be on the lookout for acts of gender persecution and look for ways to include women's voices in their investigations so that they can be responsive to what women see as the types of violations that they're experiencing in conflict and repressive situations. So I, I want to acknowledge, particularly when it comes to the Angwin case, but even earlier than that, the important role that feminist collectives, feminist scholars, feminist advocates have played in really instantiating this as a true field, not only of study, but also of practice. The feminist collective in particular here mobilized to produce four amicus briefs 
that in, clearly has informed, have informed the court. And I'm very reminiscent of the role that feminist collectives made back in the 1990s when they submitted amicus briefs to the International Criminal Tribunal for the former, for Rwanda, to make sure that sexual violence could be charged as an element of genocide. Of course, the way genocide is defined does not necessarily include a gendered element except for the fourth actus reus, the prevention of births, which of course has a gendered element and potentially also the, the transfer of children. But in so often in our, in our minds, genocide means mass killing. And so to be able to encourage the, the prosecutors and then ultimately the court to recognize that rape could be a way to commit genocide against a protected group was incredibly important. And that was because of the outside interventions of women and then having women on the inside that recognized the importance of including these stories in the larger narrative of the genocide in Rwanda. As we know, women are underrepresented in many justice systems, including the international justice system, although there are great strides being made, including through the GQAL movement. But their perspectives, their experiences, and their participation is necessary to promote trust in these institutions, to enhance the legitimacy of these institutions in the eyes of the communities in which they're serving, to ultimately advance justice by ensuring comprehensive charges are brought and comprehensive evidence as considered by courts of law, to contribute ultimately then to the substantiation of the rule of law, both internationally and domestic, and ultimately just including that, ensuring that justice processes are inclusive. That is a value in and of itself, even if the outcomes might be entirely the same. So any justice process should be representative of the wider community that is being served by that justice process. But we know, of course, how challenging it can be for women and for historically marginalized groups to navigate formal systems of justice. And so those of us that are in those systems must be constantly looking for ways to open doors for new voices, for new participants to inform and enrich the work that we're doing in these formal systems. Other challenges that we have to also re reflect is um, the obligations that many women have to balance duties in the home that may fall disproportionately on women. So we need to be constantly thinking about how we can restructure formal institutions to make it possible for people to be fully full participants while also managing obligations they have within the home. And so the amazing work that this feminist collective has done to bring these perspectives into the work of the ICC and other institutions must be acknowledged. Um, and we also have to be aware of the fact that without these sorts of voices, formal institutions and particularly law, which as we know is inherently conservative because it's premised on the concept of precedent. Um, judges and lawyers are often uncomfortable with pushing envelopes because they, they enjoy the comfort of precedent. And there may be minor and micro changes, but sometimes what is needed is much more of a dramatic evolutionary change. And it's only by virtue of, of hearing voices of, of individuals who've been ex historically excluded from these institutions that some of that revolutionary change can happen. So turning now to the field of transitional justice more broadly, and, and as I mentioned, my office is one of the main advisors within the US government on setting US policy towards transitional justice in the foreign policy sense. But I've been very keen to be focused also on efforts of transitional justice happening here in the United States. So just this week, my office was briefed by Howard University School of Law, which is a historically black university, on their research on the many efforts that are happening around this country on transitional justice. This is mostly happening at a subnational um, and not even a regional, but rather a municipal level, individual municipalities and institutions looking back with fresh eyes on their own history at historical injustices and actively looking for ways to rectify those injustices. And so it was incredibly inspiring to hear from these young people all of the different um, initiatives that they had identified. And they'll be producing a white paper soon and they'll be feeding into a larger website project. And so I encourage everyone to keep track of that. Even as we promote transition, transitional justice abroad, we must remain alive to the fact that there's much that we can be taught in our own system from the, the field of transitional justice. 
So the toolkit is a broad one, right? We often focus on criminal justice and that's important. We understand the retributive impulses and the need to hold those most responsible accountable for harms that they call, that they cause. But transitional justice also includes a number of measures of restorative justice. And that's very much what this conversation is about. Thinking about how reparations can be utilized as part of a, someone mentioned the word transformative, as, as part of a transformative justice process. We also are thinking about truth telling, we're thinking about memorialization and historical memory, and ultimately hoping to include guarantees of non-repetition. So we can think about transitional justice as setting a new normal and a new set of expectations for what justice looks like moving forward. And reparations and the rehabilitation of survivors can be an important component of those guarantees of non-repetition. We can also think about reparations more broadly as including both individual and collective reparations. And I hope during the conversation this morning, we can think creatively about how to balance those concepts so that we get the right mix, so that individuals who experienced individual harms get the reparations that they deserve, but we don't create new systems of hierarchy that might exclude other individuals who, for example, didn't participate in a justice process, but also experienced very similar harms. And that is where collective reparations can be quite helpful. Uh, in all of these mechanisms, and has been mentioned um, already this morning, the importance of understanding the needs, preferences, expectations of victims, survivors, their families, and their communities is vitally important in designing and implementing these measures. That should go without saying, but we need to keep saying it because sometimes it gets forgotten and exquisite pro programs and projects are designed in a vacuum without benefiting from the feedback and the input of those that these projects and programs are meant to serve. And so this needs to be a constant and iterative dialogue. And what victims and survivors need at one point in time may evolve as time passes and as they become farther away, they move away from the immediate harm and threats of a violent situation. And so this conversation needs to happen repeatedly as implementation is ongoing. We also need to be attuned to the importance of sustained um, focus and of thinking creatively about funding questions. And I'll, I'll return to that at the end. Um, and finally, of course, any engagement with victim and survivor communities has to be from a trauma-informed perspective. We now have very sophisticated understandings of how justice processes can be re-traumatizing of individuals that are put through them, individuals who are treated as mere witnesses for a prosecution, individuals who are subjected to harsh and unfair cross-examination, individuals who are instrumentalized by a justice process. And so those of us who are inside of these systems need to be very careful about ensuring that these processes, even though they're difficult, and of course, defendants are entitled to confront the evidence and the witnesses against them, but it needs to be done in a way that is not re-traumatizing to survivors and victims that are participating in those. And that can include the importance of victim representation so that victims are independently represented by advocates who are focused on their well-being and ensuring that they have a meaningful experience in justice. And I know looking in the audience here, and I imagine online as well, there are a number of individuals who have played that vitally important role within justice systems. It is critical to acknowledge the significance of this Anguin case. Um, obviously, there have been previous cases that have involved charges of conflict-related sexual violence, of gender-based violence, et cetera. But here we have the first case to acknowledge reproductive violence, and particularly forced pregnancy, by an international community, by an international, by an international court. And it's, it's hoped, of course, that this precedent will trickle down into national systems that might be facing similar type of fact patterns. The fact that more than 120 states have ratified the ICC statute, and many of those have incorporated the enumerated crimes within that statute into their domestic code, is an incredible opportunity to ensure that the jurisprudence that is developed by the ICC, if, if not precedential or authoritative, um, or binding within a national system will nonetheless be guiding, will be a, a source of, um, of inspiration, of ideas, of, of, 
um, for judges, for advocates, et cetera, to utilize what's being created at the international level in their domestic systems. But this, of course, has to be a two-way street. So the International Criminal Court should also, at the same time, be canvassing jurisprudence that's being developed at the national level to inform its own consideration of how to interpret its statute, the elements of crimes, and the crimes that it's um, that it's adjudicating. And so this is a two-way conversation that's happening, and essentially is, is very much at the essence of what complementarity is supposed to be about. These courts, this community of courts are in conversation with each other. They can inform each other's work to move the jurisprudence forward. We also have to be understanding of the fact that sometimes institutions can rather than be um, forward leaning and progressive can actually be regressive. And so looking out for, and even if it's done inadvertently, the reproduction of certain types of narratives of certain dialogues based in colonialism, for example, imperialism, racism, heteronormativity, we need to be very alive to how those can creep into even our own thinking and our own discourse and be constantly evaluating whether or not that is happening and looking for ways to, to move beyond those sort of inherited, um, those her inherited practices and, and, um, and ways of thinking. Uh, Margaret mentioned something quite interesting, and I know it didn't apparently didn't get discussed yesterday, but thinking about the role of children in these situations. Angwin presented that in a very unique way. A former child soldier who remained with the Lord's Resistance Army went on to assume a leadership role. There's been some very interesting conversations about the, how and the degree to which that life experience impacted the final sentence that he received. It's unclear, uh, I think, how the court uh, incorporated that experience in coming up with the, the, the sentence it did. It was a rather opaque ruling in that regard. But we also have other children that are relevant to this particular situation country. And that is, of course, the children that are born of sexual violence, born of the fact that their mothers were abducted, often when their mothers were themselves children. And this is a blind spot, I think, within international criminal law and an area where we need further theorization, further practice to think about how to conceptualize those children as victims and survivors in their own right, given the fact that they will be quite vulnerable to stigmatization, quite vulnerable to exclusion from their communities, quite vulnerable to um, exploitation and recruitment themselves into armed groups. They may be excluded from educational systems or health systems. They may have not have the right to an identity, which we know is a, an internationally protected human right, the right to a nationality. They might not be entitled to papers that would then open a whole series of doors for them in terms of social services, educational opportunities, et cetera. And so we need to be constantly looking for ways that a transitional justice system can vindicate the whole panoply of rights, not just civil and political rights, but also economic, social, and cultural rights. And then of course, um, and this gets at this idea of guarantees of non-repetition, we need to be looking for root causes and structural inequalities, discrimination, um, inherited ways of operating within and amongst each other and looking for ways to that a transitional justice process could overcome those rather than re-entrench those. And so thinking about DDR programs that give benefits to men who were recruited or who joined armed groups, but that may not give similar benefits to women who were also recruited and joined and abducted into armed groups. We need to be constantly alive to the way in which some of the interventions that are being done, even under uh, justice-focused um, framework or rubric, might be falling back on assumptions, on stereotypes, and, on, and, and reinforcing historical ways of operating. So, as we know, reparations can take many forms, including restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, measures of satisfaction, psychosocial rehabilitation, and guarantees of non-repetition. They can be quite practical, tangible. They can also be symbolic. They can be individual. They can be collective. The goal, of course, is for them to be transformative. We, of course, we all know that we can never return individual survivors to the positions they were before their life plans were indelibly disrupted by violence. But the goal should be to enable them to return to the position in which they can, they can have a life plan, they can pursue a new life plan. And in doing this, we must be careful also not to consider victims as indelibly broken, but we know that there is the possibility of post-traumatic growth. 
that trauma can actually open up new ways of thinking, new ways of operating, new opportunities, that if survivors are given the means to do so in terms of their own psychosocial rehabilitation, but also livelihood assistance and other ways to get them back on their feet in order to have economic autonomy, we know that kind of growth can happen. And that should be the goal of any reparations um, any reparation system. Um, we want to reinvert the moral universe um, and return survivors to uh, a life path of their own choosing. But we also have to understand and manage expectations here. And the, the question of, of resources was raised. Um, you know, even the most well-resourced system may never be able to come up with the kind of funding that would be necessary to return women and survivors to, um, to the kind of life path that they might have envisioned for themselves. And so we need to be creative about looking for new sources of funding while also managing expectations on the part of victims' communities. So we can't go in and promise reparations if we don't have a, a ready set of funding to be able to, to resource those reparations and to think creatively about how collective or symbolic reparations may be useful, even if they're not what victims expect or desire or ultimately deserve. We also have to be very careful about implementing reparations in ways that don't create new, um, new resentments or vulnerabilities within communities. So individuals who may suddenly have access to resources that others within their community don't have, they themselves can be vulnerable to violence. I've seen this in my own work, working with survivors who have won civil judgments in US courts. Suddenly their role is very public. Everyone is aware that they have won uh, a, a, an award, even if it's not the full amount that was awarded to them by the court, if they received some um, funding by way of compensation, they can be very vulnerable to petty crime. Um, they can be vulnerable to individuals coming out of the woodwork, to people feeling resentment because they did not experience, they may have experienced the same violence, but they weren't a part of a legal process that rendered them able to receive some sort of a compensation award. And so thinking about working with, and this is again where the role of survivor advocates can be very helpful, how do we message the role that survivors play in victim in, in justice processes, and how do we ensure that they're not targeted by virtue of their participation or, or the subject of resentments or recreating various um, vulnerabilities and hierarchies of victimhood within particular communities. So um, I have very little experience myself in Uganda. I've, I've been there as a, a young person who was working on um, women's health issues in East Africa, but a member of my team did visit Uganda recently with the Trust Fund for Victims. This was a trip that was organized by the Irish um, embassy. Um, a whole number of different states participated. It was quite an impactful visit. Um, my staff member was quite moved by um, not only the degree of resilience within some of these communities within northern Uganda, um, but also the fact that they had been many, in many respects, largely forgotten by the Ugandan state. Very little had been done by way of implementation. They were still feeling, I think, very marginalized. The Trust Fund for Victims is there and is doing important work. The ICC Trust Fund is doing important work, but it's incomplete. Um, and it, it needs to have, be working more in partnership with uh, the local authorities, but also with the broader international community um, into sort of thinking creatively about how we can continue to fund the trust fund for victims so that it can do its good work um, in a way that is, um, that is transformative and fair and inclusive to those communities. So I thought I'd close by just identifying several critical avenues of discussion that I hope we can take up in the Q&A session and in the rest of the day today, um, not only on how to design, but also how to implement reparations. These are things that we should be striving for. Of course, this is by no means exhaustive, um, and I really welcome the opportunity to hear from others here about how I can continue to add to and refine this list that I've, I'm sort of thinking about in my own head as, as we do this work um, within the U.S., my new purchase in the U.S. government. Um, and so I hope that this can be the part of an ongoing dialogue um, with everyone here and with, with folks online. So first, um, you know, as has been discussed, Pamela, I think really um, put a, a really fine point on it this morning. Victims and survivors need to play a central role in the design and implementation of reparations. Survivor center approaches must be inclusive, right? We have to look not only to what may be the most visible victim group within a particular community, but also those marginalized groups that may themselves have experienced 
various forms of harm. So this includes, of course, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, um, intersex, and other persons, LGBTQI communities, including those that may be targeted on the basis of their sexual orientation, their gender identity or expression, or their sex characteristics. We sh should also be um, attuned to sexual violence that may be committed against men and boys who may have a very difficult time coming forward and speaking about those experiences because of deeply entrenched stigmatization associated with that set of harms. Persons from racially and ethnically uh, marginalized communities, youth, persons with disabilities, refugees, internally displaced persons who may have difficulty plugging into formal processes because they're displaced from their natural communities. And so any transitional justice outreach program, design, uh, implementation, follow-up must always be on the lookout for communities that may not be the easiest ones to reach. And so looking for ways to make this a uh, inclusive and, and um, comprehensive process. Support systems must be made available to survivors and their families so that they can participate in a process that may take them away from economic activity that would otherwise, otherwise be critical to support their families. And so looking for ways to help with childcare, to help with transportation, to hold hearings on days where work, um, there may be a day of rest where people can travel more easily or to ensure that people can leave their formal places of work without penalties in order to participate in a justice process. Ways to re replace the capital that might be lost for, for individuals who are participating um, and ensure that, that there's um, pathways for people to participate, even if they're needed um, at home and elsewhere. Um, any approach that we take must be trauma informed. We know how to do this. There is very solid research. We know there are training programs available. Anyone who is doing outreach in the transitional justice space, it should be ensured that they have engaged in one of these trainings and that they understand what the best practices are and that they're constantly um, updating their own approaches to doing this work so that they understand the impact that they might be having, even if inadvertent, within survivor communities. Critically, too, is um, co-creation, the idea that victims and survivors should be a part of a process of designing and implementing these processes. They are not, they're not simply the beneficiaries of them, they should be the originators of them. And so any system by which a transitional justice process is being conceptualized must include from the beginning representatives, survivors, et cetera, to ensure that their voices are fully heard. Um, and I think Victoria mentioned this in, in her remarks quite, um, quite cogently. Um, anticipating tensions. As we are designing mechanisms, we have to be on the lookout for the way in which they may generate tensions within communities and place victims and survivors in new difficult positions with respect to their neighbors and others. I mentioned this earlier, but that should be a part of the design. Um, and part of that may be simply messaging, but doing also broader outreach within those communities so that everyone understands why the system was designed and implemented the way it was, what the thinking was that went into that, and then also looking for ways to be more inclusive so that others may benefit from um, whatever reparations or transitional justice mechanisms are being utilized. We also have to think about how to empower national schemes. So we have the Trust Fund for Victims, for example, or we may have a program that's funded by a foreign government like my own that may be happening at one level, while in parallel, there are national level or even subnational efforts that are happening. We need to make sure that they are additive and not subtractive of each other, that they're working in tandem with each other, that they understand each other, and can actually envision potentially a division of labor where we can ensure that different communities are being responded to with respect to what's happening at an international level or with foreign funding versus what's being done at the national level. Um, I think we need to think creatively about how to balance symbolic, individual, and collective reparations. I think that is another area that is under theorized. We have seen some, for example, in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, doing very sophisticated work around symbolic and collective reparations. And what can we learn from that system in the transitional justice context that might be helpful and, and could be adapted to the communities in which we're working? Collective reparations in particular can be very helpful, I think, at addressing forms of structural violence, of deep-seated discrimination and exclusion of particular groups, um, and to ensure that we can build new systems, new ways of operating, new institutions that will overcome some of those historical um, 
historical limitations. Um, but at the same time, we shouldn't lose sight of the importance, of course, of individual rep um, re reparations as well. Um, in terms of funding, so I think a lot more thinking needs to be done around creative forms of funding. Um, the Trust Fund for Victims, for example, is still even now, um, you know, more than a decade after its creation, enti almost entirely reliant upon voluntary contributions from states. Are there not other sources that could be tapped into, including ordinary people around the world who I know have a natural empathy for the experience of victims of violence around the world and would be very happy to contribute, but there is at present really no pathway for people to do that within the Trust Fund for Victims. For example, the trust fund does not have the ability to accept tax exempt donations here in the United States, and we know right or wrong, that very much guides the way people do philanthropy here in this country. And so to get the trust fund to a point where it's able to accept those sort of tax-free um, donations will be incredibly important. And then to have a campaign of outreach to reach, to reach philanthropic communities around the world and just ordinary individuals who might want to give $10 a month to the trust fund for victims. $10 a month can go a long way towards rehabilitating, especially if we aggregate those sort of micro donations that might be inspired through Girl Scout clubs, through the Rotary Club, through other um, organizations, civic organizations here within the United States. I also think we can look into how to bridge the gap between situations that have a sanctions regime associated with them that may generate fines, forfeitures, penalties of huge amounts that could be repurposed towards rehabilitating survivors and victims. So I'm thinking in particular about the Lafarge case. So Lafarge was a cement company that was working in Northern Syria uh, with ISIS, basically enabling itself to continue to make enorm enormous sums of money within, nor within Northern Syria by virtue of making payments to ISIS in violation of sanctions regimes. They have now issued a, uh, a guilty plea and they have agreed to pay more than $700 million in fines um, and other penalties. Where's that money going? And why is some percentage of it not going to the Yazidi community that experienced a genocide at the hands of ISIS? We need to think creatively about, as prosecutors um, negotiate these settlement agreements, negotiating with the companies to put aside some percentage for survivors as a goodwill gesture to acknowledge the harm that their collaboration with armed groups may have caused. Um, we need to educate uh, Congress to potentially create a new legislative framework that would be a, a fund that survivors could tap into um, in order it, it, when, when funding is developed and, and appears through these sort of fines and forfeitures. So these are just very preliminary ideas, uh, but I hope to see these out there in this community of brilliant people who care deeply about um, making reparations a reality for survivors. So finally, um, in closing, of course, the boundaries of violence are not temporal. Temporal Trauma and suffering can be ceaseless and enduring, but we can also see post-traumatic growth. And so we need to be constantly evolving the way in which we're thinking about applying, implementing, and following up on various measures to ensure that they're still fit for purpose, to ensure that they're still responding to the needs, hopes, expectations, and preferences of the communities they're trying to serve. Um, but we know that the concept of transitional justice is valuable. It exists for us. It, it gives us a set of tools to address legacies of mass violence and repression, um, to rebuild social cohesion, to rehabilitate survivors. And so um, it's a really rich and generative field um, that's constantly benefiting from the brilliant ideas of people in the room here. So in closing, as I mentioned at the outset, I do think we are really in the midst of a precedent setting moment that can def define how reparation schemes are conceptualized, how they're funded, how they're implemented, how they're designed. Um, it should be trauma-informed, it should be survivor-centric, it should be intersectional, it should be inclusive of all individuals who experienced harm and, and suffered under whatever the violent regime that is under consideration. Um, and we must seize this moment to really support survivors and victims as a, as a global community that cares deeply about, about these issues and that, that wants to ensure um, not only a, a, a guarantees of non-repetition, but also that individuals can return to a, a life path that is one of dignity and one of autonomy. So I really look forward to furthering the conversation with all of you today, and, and thank you for including me in this gathering.
my dear Patty. <laughs> my dear Beth. <laughs> Thank you so much for your words. Oh, I, great to see you. It's great to see you. I wish you were, I wish that you were our UN ambassador. I really do. Okay, but I do. <laughs> Don't, don't ever underestimate Linda Thomas Greenfield. She is a force to be reckoned with. No, when, when she wants to gracefully move on to other issues, maybe be our president, okay? Oh, I like how you think. But <laughs> <laughs> Patty has big plans. So I, I want to respond to a couple of the issues that you brought up. And one I Please. think Pamela raised before, in particularly uh, children yes. born of not just sexual violence. I'd like to couch it of children born while their mothers were enslaved. Yes. That we understand that these children were born enslaved. And mm -hmm. so there has been theoretical thinking and legal characterization that is beginning uh, to formulate. And to let you know that that as special advisor for slavery crimes, that will be my advice to the prosecutor, that we make sure that these children are seen as direct victim mm -hmm. survivors and not indirect victim mm -hmm. Patty, your work in this area has been just brilliant, honestly. The, the fact that you have revived the concept of slavery and made it actionable in a way that you have. Um, we have in our own domestic code, slavery provisions that have never been used. And so we need to be thinking more creatively about how to um, activate those Beth, I was provisions. gonna pull you aside later on today too. But exactly instead you're gonna put me on the spot right now, here in public. You, you announced it publicly, okay. <laughs> And so I just want to say also that we will be creating a slavery policy at the International Criminal Court and the Office of the Prosecutor in the coming year. And I would specifically like to get back to our panelists, uh, Victoria and Angela, and mm -hmm. people here in the room so that we can think more creatively and understanding enslavement and hopefully slave trade. The other thing I'd like to announce is about two weeks ago, the government, government of Sierra Leone announced at the General Assembly that they would like to amend yes. the Rome Statute and to look at provisions under crimes against humanity to look at the slave trade as well as enslavement. Because while we use words of abduction, kidnap, their legal characterization is slave trading mm -hmm. and including redistribution of child soldiers and wives. Redistribution is really a code name for the crime of slave trade. So I just wanna highlight that as we move forward in this wonderful collective of feminist thought, women's thought. We are changing the world and international criminal law. Can I give one last little indication of yesterday? I appreciated so much, uh, Sarah Victoria, understanding that we need to look at history and the roots of how did these problems that become international crimes begin. And I think that we can. If we look back at the Rwanda jurisprudence, we remember the crucial coloniality of issuing ID cards mm -hmm. to distinguish who was a Hutu and a Tutsi, which led to the death of many people whose ID card said Tutsi. And that was started by Belgium and German colon uh, colonialism. If we look at Ukraine today, and we see that it is still in essence separating from what used to be the former Soviet uh, Socialist Republic, we can look at Ukraine as a type of decolonization war. So I think these ideals historically, and as they play out today, and the harms that they enforce today via armed conflict, I think that women, we need to look at our histories and our histories of how they are caught in decolonization or how they are caught within a political kind of proxy war at time. And we're allowed to look at evidence of that and to situate why these harms occur, what were their roots, so that our transitional justice can transit us out of the root causes of those harms. Thank you for that, Patty. That's uh, brilliant as ever. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right that the fact that neither slavery nor trafficking are mentioned as constitutive acts of crimes against humanity within the Rome Statute is a real blind spot. And you know, we just dropped the ball back in the, the back in the '90s when that was being drafted. And so that's really interesting to see Sierra Leone's proposal. I will say that there has been floating around Congress in the here in the United States um, a draft crimes against humanity bill that actually includes 
the trafficking crimes as constitutive acts. It's a little bit of a weird statute in the sense that it's not based upon the Rome statute formulation, but rather borrows from existing criminal prohibitions within Title 18, which is our penal code, and then puts them under the classic crimes against humanity chapeau. And so it's an opportunity to actually rectify that blind spot if we ever were to get that passed within the United States. And so the administration, Biden-Harris is very supportive of that. You may have heard um, Vice President um, Kamala Harris, you mentioned the war in Ukraine, but at the Munich Security Conference, she gave very strong remarks identifying crimes against humanity underway within, within Ukraine. And so I think she's very keen to see this move forward as well as a former prosecutor herself. There's spoke in the back there. Yes, I'm Michael Myers, head president of New York Civil Rights Coalition. And I, have a very naive, I have a very naive question, and that's what it is, not a statement, not an opinion. Uh, but what is the possibility of treating in people individually in terms of reparations, people who don't, don't want to be where they used to be or mm -hmm. live where they used to live. They want to get the hell out. Mm -hmm. They want to come to, in quotes, America, where they can have a new home, new financing, new opportunities, a fresh start. Is there any, is that in the definition of reparations that people can get the hell out of there and come to what they consider to be the dreamland? Such an interesting question, Mike. Yeah, I mean, yeah, money and home. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, I think in many respects, it's it's implicit in what I was saying about the 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 hope that a reparation scheme would put people back on a pathway to chart their own course in life, whatever that looks like, whether that means leaving their community or whether that means reinstantiating themselves into that community. It's giving them that sense of, of agency, I think, is what we want to see out of a reparation scheme, particularly if it involves you know, livelihood assistance or, or a financial transaction of some sort versus something that's more symbolic or, or collective. And so, you know, thinking about the children, for example, giving them citizenship, like that is, that can be in and of itself a reparation so that then they have the ability to travel. They have the ability to apply for travel papers and all of that. And so we need to not be thinking about, and, and sometimes money is actually hard to come up with. And these other more um, transformative types of reparations can actually be more impactful. And so let's not let the fact that we can't raise money to give into individuals, you know, a $2,000 check, let's not that have, have us just throw off our hands and say, oh, we can't do reparations. No, we can be creative. We can look for ways to enhance the ability of people to have the life plan that they want. Um, and this may include leaving potentially, right? That's their, that's their choice. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, so um, thank you so much. I just wanted to bring more context to the issue of children born of war, mm -hmm. um, because it's it's something that I'm really proud about. It started from a small outreach that I conducted in northern Uganda, and the girls, um, it was part of civil registration, and one of the girls told me that they cannot send their child to school mm. because their child doesn't have a birth certificate, and the school is asking for a birth certificate and she 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 doesn't know the father of the child because while in rebellion the men use code names the certificate requires a full name mm -hmm. so there were challenges with civil registration these children don't have birth certificates they do not have national ids which impacts a whole social economic rights so we decided while we are trying to draft the policy, I said there's something that we can do even in the absence of a policy, in the, in the absence of a law. So we conducted a pilot study just in, a, in one of the, the regions. And um, as a result of that study, we have engaged the government to recognize, to fast track the registration of these children. One of the biggest issues is, as we all know, the legal framework right now is the biggest stumbling block. Every country requires a child to get a birth certificate from where they were born. I think it's the same requirement with every country. So these are children who are born in the forests of Sudan, of Garamba, of Central African Republic, and it would be unfair to expect them to get birth certificates from there. So it's a whole issue of policy change. Can we have exceptions within our laws to recognize these children, give them identity? Because right now they don't have identity, even in their own communities. The girls, it's it's a whole big story that they cannot be accepted by even their matrilineal families because they are considered children of the enemy. So it's a whole social, economic, cultural dynamic that I am so happy that if we can take it on, 
in this forum. I think it's something that will do good to justice for these children. I, I think Bosnia has already recognized these children. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, if it's also done for Uganda, I think it would be great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Margaret. That's such an important point, right? Overcoming stigmatization and such can be incredibly difficult, right? That's deep-seated. We can fix the legal framework, right? We can do that, right? That's not that hard, y'all. So yeah, I agree completely. That's great. Yes, um, Your Excellency, thank you so much. One of the things I wanted to still repeat is the issues of children born of war. Connecting from what Margaret said, we had so many dialogue with government, internal affairs, and the justice and constitutional affairs. Right now, I think the government has accepted and they are willing to do registration of children born of war. This is uh, because these are stateless children. You know what it means to be stateless in your own country and you're a child. And each time they surround children or youth and young people in criminality, they turn out to be the one criminals and yet they do not have identity. So why am I saying this now is the fact that I believe that in Uganda, the US embassy has certain level of influence. Uh, what is standing out is that the government said they do not have resources, one, to uh, put a policy, a guideline for the registration, and they are willing to do the registration. And so they also need that process to be supported by donors or mm -hmm. a diplomatic community. Is it something that you think that the US embassy can follow up uh, to rectify that processes? The second thing I wanted to talk about is the issues of the Trust Fund for Victim and the ICC support, especially on physical rehabilitation of war victims. Uh, to note that the war victims are still having splinters and bullet splint in their bodies, and they need uh, also orthosis and prosthesis management. I personally work with the Trust Fund for Victim and the ICC for nine years. But right now, the ICC and the Trust Fund for Victim withdrew their support, mm. and they are no longer supporting. They are more interested on mental health. Mm. Uh, again, you understand in the context of Uganda that the DGF was one of the basket for the EU uh, that was supporting partners in physical rehabilitation of war victims. Unfortunately, the DGF is closed. Mm. Uh, they didn't have an understanding with government. So apparently in the last reparation sessions we had in Gulu uh, early this week, we had over 15 women present with bullet splinters on their body and they need physical medical rehabilitation. And this all support in Uganda right now is closed. Again, I would want to see how your foreign policy department at the US Embassy in Kampala, if this can interest them. Finally, is the issues of petition, especially related to the bill of the policy. Um, the TJ policy has reached a level where this is again the best moment to follow it up with parliament because the bill is ready. And I'm happy that Margaret uh, here is seated within the same ministry, and that is also her focus. Mm -hmm. But there is need to support parliament to round themselves on uh, passing this bill into law. Again, looking at reparation that we shall discuss, there is a possibility of interim reparations. We can't wait for the bill. We know what people are going through, and there is a provision of interim reparation. Interim reparations mean that you can give reparative support for the current needs, such as people that need medical support, people that need uh, that support, but it has to come through a certain level of programming. Mm -hmm. Also, is this something that I believe uh, with your rich presentation this morning, I think these are issues that can be followed up because people who have wounds and are in pain cannot wait for all the policy to come out. The TJ policy in Uganda, Margaret knows, took over 15 years yeah. and until now is still on the table. Thank you. Thank you for that, Pamela. I'll take that on. Two over here, it looks like. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry I wasn't here yesterday. I it, Apparently I missed a lot, but um, mm -hmm. thank you for, for your remarks, Beth. Um, one just small point, you're being really modest about your office in Uganda, Beth. I feel like I've run into David and Kampala many times over the last several years. He was working on supporting victim participation um, practice at the ICD and then witness protection brainstorming with the Office of the Prosecutor. So 
I feel like your office has been very present. At least I've run into your folks many times over the last several years. One never feels like one is doing enough. So <laughs> no, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, and then your your thought, Pamela, about and and also Margaret about the the administrative need for mundane things like birth certificates. I think that's that's totally right. And what I've seen in other contexts too is that we also do as we as we move towards that have to be careful that. The procedure itself is not onerous and stigmatizing for the mother who has to come forward and report, right? Just in Poland right now, for a Ukrainian woman to get access to abortion, she has to convince and prove the fact of rape in order to qualify for an exemption, which is incredibly difficult. It's a different situation, but also we have to make sure that the processes for registration don't require the mother to go through a very, very painful process of proving the fact that this is a child born of wartime sexual violence, for example. And so it's a little bit, um, maybe another consideration as we move towards these otherwise seemingly mundane paper processes. Um, and then other thoughts similarly with law reform in Uganda in particular, it's, it's, there are a number of things that I'm thinking about. One is in the, in the Coelho case, something that I was intimately working on where I think I've, I've met you perhaps, Margaret, many years ago. Um, part of the, the statutory gap there, they have the 1964 Geneva Conventions Act, but it, we had some retroactivity issues in terms of applying, um, using the war crime statute for these crimes, actually, because it was deemed a non-international armed conflict following the Ongwen example at the ICC. So there's a little bit of repair, I think, and gap filling to do in terms of the, the legal framework around international crimes in the Ugandan system but then also, Beth, you mentioned you know, the need to make sure we're also including, and all of you actually, the inclusivity of folks who are more marginalized. If we're also thinking about communities of people who may be terrified by current developments in the legislature of the anti-homosexuality bill, which has risen its ugly head yet again um, in the parliament and is waiting signature, um, you know, some other laws, some other facets of the Ugandan statutory framework have a chilling effect on certain populations. And so if we want them to participate in these processes, we have to understand the effect of, effect of other parts of the statutory framework also, which may keep them from doing that for very, very real reasons. So those are just some thoughts I had. And thank you so much. Um, I look forward to more dialogue today. Thanks, Kim. Great content. Um, I just had a question regarding um, these efforts to build for example, U.S. constituency for international justice or other kind of international solidarities, especially in the context of the U.S. where um, we know that that the position towards the ICC has not been historically very positive. Um, how can we try to build um, domestic in the U.S. Um, resilience uh, in our support for international justice? And also, how can we seize moments like uh, international solidarity with Ukraine to try to make that infrastructure more robust for everyone mm -hmm. so that the support that we see coming out for some situations of conflict is not limited to those situations of conflict and actually helps to build a more robust system rather than building pockets of strength and pockets of neglect or weakness? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a terrific question. Um, and I'm definitely trying to do more work domestically. So giving talks around the country just to to speak about what what we do do in this space, which is a lot of good. I mean, particularly this administration has really made international justice one of their core priorities in terms of foreign policy. And even before I was confirmed into my position, the government announced a reset with respect to the International Criminal Court. And the goal now is to put it on a more durable pathway so that we don't have the kind of wild swings that we've seen with different administrations. Um, it, it really does make it difficult to have a kind of lasting policy and a lasting impact. But you know, a, a story that I often tell, which is actually so much more appropriate in this environment than in others, was when I was deputy in this office, was right around the time that that Coney 2012 video came out. And there was lots of problems with that video, right? We know that it was very inaccurate and all that. But if we think about silver linings, it really captured the imagination of the American people who realized that there was this messianic figure out there abducting people, wrecking havoc in local communities, 
there were children in my little tiny town in, in Northern California walking through town with signs saying capture Coney. And th- what happened was people began to call their members of Congress. And then members of Congress would call my office and say, what are we doing about this guy, Coney? Who is he? What's going on? What, why aren't we in the lead here? And because there was that pressure from constituents, from voters, from ordinary communities, that put it on the agenda at Congress Congress then became educated about what was happening in Northern Uganda. And a whole bunch of important things came from that, including um, there were special forces on the ground that were looking for Tkoni. There was the Northern Uganda Reconstruction Act that got passed that I hope, I hope brought a lot of good, although probably not as much as people needed. Um, it really changed the way we approached the International Criminal Court. Our War Crimes Rewards Program was able to be utilized to offer rewards for members of the Lord's Resistance Army. There is still a reward out for Joseph Coney taking this position. I have revitalized that campaign. We've actually coming up with some new ways to spread information about the fact that that reward exists in the hope that folks within his inner circle might be willing to come forward. The real challenge there, and there may be people in this room that can help, we actually often know where he is. There's no one to arrest him. And that is a regional problem, right? That ungoverned area where we know he is operating. um, And the country's around that ungoverned area have their own domestic internal political crises, including but not limited to what we're seeing in Sudan. And so, um, you know, that is the that is the current challenge when it comes to Kony. But the larger point is when members of Congress hear from their constituents that they care about this stuff, that they have expectations that members of Congress are going to use the incredible privilege that they have of serving the American people to draft legislation, to create policies, to make money available for this work, things happen. And so ultimately that is where a lot of the people in this room come, you know, don't just speak and operate in these rarefied worlds of of academics and feminist collectives and this and that we need to be talking to our neighbors. We need to be talking to our crazy uncles, you know, whatever it happens to be, get people in. Because I do think there's a natural empathy. And if you look at polling data, American, the American people want the United States to play a leadership role. They don't always know what that looks like because they don't necessarily have a broader understanding of the architecture of international justice, but the impulse is there. And so how can we make this more of a mainstream field so that people feel as strongly about this as they do about Save the Children or UNICEF or these other big international institutions. Hi, we have a question from one of our online guests, Ella Matthews. You mentioned the Lafarge. Hello, Ella. <laughs> you mentioned the Lafarge funds should be used to provide some reparations to the Yazidi community. What avenues exist to make that happen? There are none. That's my point. I think we need to be creative. This needs to happen farther upstream so that when something like that gets announced in public, it's an incredible outcome. It's to be commended that the company, you know, was brought to heel in this way, forced to acknowledge. We know that the Center for Justice and Accountability, I think, is involved in a parallel case that's happening in France against the company. I'm imagining there are some precedential value that can be drawn from the guilty plea and the admission of various facts by the company in connection with the sanctions avail- evasion litigation here that will inform that French trial. But we don't have an existing fund. There isn't any sort of legal obligation to to work with these entities that are ultimately engaged in plea negotiations to ensure that they create a, a small fund that would make, enable victims to benefit from the money that is created, the fines that are levied against these companies for um, their complicity and abuses. So that, that needs, again, that's an area where I think we need to do some thinking. We have in the United States, the Victims of Crime Act, which helps United States victims of crime. It offers a place for them to go and seek restitution. Should there not be something parallel, I, I can imagine we could come up with something if we put our heads together. Thanks so much, Beth. Um, great remarks. I particularly uh, appreciated your remarks about funding, about being creative um, and needing to innovate around funding. Um, several years back, we did a report, the War Crimes Research Office did a report for the Special Criminal Court on reparations. And we looked mm. at some of the creative thinking that had come out of different kinds of contexts. Uh, Guatemala with reparations out of the Sepusargo case, uh, the, the Extraordinary Chambers, what we called project partnership uh, reparations, right, which were a combination of um, civil society groups with, part, with funding from different states, um, kind of uh, in 
endorsed by the court. Um, we looked at trust fund, uh, the trust fund possibilities. And so I, I really, uh, I think I, I, I encourage this creative thinking, but one of the things that came up for us was um, how do we do this without de-incentivizing states right. from uh, continuing, uh, not continuing, but but increasing their support uh, for these processes for 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 reparations? And I think there's, you know, I think it's it's one thing that we have to continue to think about how that balance between, you know, individual, private, Lafarge, you know, and other, uh, because more is better, no question. Yeah. But how we do that without Yet, you know, without letting states off the hook. Yeah, Susanna, as usual, brilliant comment. Um, and your work at the War Crimes Research Center is just always of the highest quality. It's so brilliant. Please send me that report again, because I'm returning to these issues and I haven't read it in a while. So I'd love to see some of the ideas there. No, you're absolutely right. It's got to be both and, right? That there are expectations that the state itself has a duty because um, it has a duty to offer avenues to justice and it's these are their citizens. But at the same time, we have to, I think, acknowledge the wider international system that sometimes enables this violence to happen. And there are enablers within that. And we've, we have not done enough thinking about, I, I don't know to what extent that's true in Northern Uganda, but certainly in other violent situations, we have seen corporate enablers, big multinational corporations that are either benefiting from turning a blind eye to, or somehow navigating a, within a system of mass violence. And, and in some cases they are benefiting from it, right? Because it creates a level of chaos that avoids various forms of regulation. So you're right, we need to keep states on the hook, but also I think look for other actors that may have a bear responsibility here. Well, thank you so much, everyone. This was such a pleasure, brilliant questions and comments. Um, and I look forward to continue to brainstorm some of these issues over the course of the morning. Thank you.